Uh, my name is William Kilbride. I work for this strange, shadowy little organisation called the Digital Preservation Coalition. And it's my pleasure to be speaking to you today and to also to thank Judy and colleagues for the invitation and for the work that they've put in to bringing us here. I've got kind of 15 minutes to give you a kind of whistle-stop tour of the digital preservation issues. And I've decided really just to play a fairly straight bat, just to talk about digital preservation, the issues, and how we've tried to address those issues. Uh, some of you will know that in previous work, though, I've had quite a good rant, uh, a ramble, or, or, or challenge to the 3D data community uh, in particular. So if you want to follow some of that up, maybe some of that will also come up in conversation. But for today, the purpose is a very straightforward presentation around the issues of digital preservation. So what's the problem? Uh, let's, a show of hands of anyone in the room who has ever lost anything that they were working on. If you've not got your hand in the air, come and finish the presentation. <laughs> It's a regular, familiar story for us. We are uh, used to the idea of data loss, whether through obsolescence or bit rot or media decay or a range uh, of different issues. Let's pause before we get to the issues to think what's at stake. Uh, all sorts of things are at stake, and it depends how you cut this question up. Structured and unstructured data is at stake, digitized and born digital material. Everything from the selfie to the space probe, uh, things of, of ephemeral passing value, things of uh, millennial long-lived uh, value, all of those sorts of material are at stake. And to summarize that, anything with a life cycle longer than its platform, anything you want to access beyond the life cycle of the platform on which it's based falls in the scope of digital preservation. We've heard a lot about that today. What does that mean? Well, it means all of this kind of stuff, uh, all of these different types of digital materials are going to fall in scope in one form or another uh, for preservation purposes. And I'll talk about what I mean by preservation uh, later in the presentation, but just work with me on this just now. And that means, uh, again, there for anything with a long-lived business process. It means digital art and digital art installations. It's going to mean uh, movie productions. It's going to mean all the different sorts of materials that we've heard about uh, all uh, ready today. And, and I ask, what questions are your users going to come to you with about accessing that content? What promises have you made explicitly or implicitly? Let's ask that in the way we should ask it this week because it changes week to week, let's ask this week, what promises implicitly did MySpace make about music? And they didn't make any promises they would keep it, but by jingo they've lost it, and that's a problem. Anyway, let's keep moving. What's the problem here? Well, this is Digital preservation is characteristically one of those kind of naughty problems, a wicked problem which changes as it evolves and contains many different moving parts. So here's your standard set of definitions or standard kind of list of digital preservation challenges. And the breaking news is this is not breaking news. The important point to make is that we've known about these issues for at least 20 years and have been actively working at addressing those issues over that period. So there's quite a lot of learning we can share about the experience of trying to solve these issues from the digital preservation community. I'm gonna want you to kind of imagine me leaving this slide on the screen because I'm gonna add a couple of layers to this uh, slide as well. So we have all of these, what you might call technical or technical and organizational sets of challenges around retaining access to digital materials. The second lesson from the digital preservation community over that 20 years, frankly, is that people with something to hide are as big a threat to the digital estate as obsolescence. Maybe less of an issue in this community, perhaps, but it's striking to me. You know, one of the things that we run is the, uh, the bit list. Okay, the global list of digitally endangered species. And when we did the call for proposals for nominations to the bit list, US environmental data appears on the bit list. US environmental data, you know, not Canadian environmental data. And what we're pointing to there is the issue of, you know, people 
frankly, you know, trying to extract themselves from that which might be unfortunate to their own political or personal narrative. So, trying to get rid of unhelpful evidence turns out to be quite a threat to the digital estate. Perhaps not an issue in this room, perhaps more of an issue uh, in this room are changing business plans. Changing business plans turn out to be as big a threat to the digital estate uh, as obsolescence. Let's look at the, you know, the greatest hits. Uh, and we read today, literally today, as I am, um, oh, my fingers are all sweaty. Google, we learned today, Google is shutting down its in-house VR film studio. Breaking news. So, if you think your service provider's not on this list, you're probably kidding yourself. And we hear sometimes that business will do this. Or, you know, you look at the amounts of money, Google, Amazon, the Fangs, whoever it is, the amounts of money they can put in to making a sustainable business model is tremendous. But remember that the 22 largest companies by value on the stock market this year, it's the 22 largest companies equal the value of the Dutch East India Company when it was at its largest. I don't see them advertising on the tube the Dutch East India Company. That is to say, a corporate, you know, simply because something is a financially very attractive proposition now doesn't make it financially viable for the long term. So changing business models turn out to be as big a threat as obsolescence. Finally, as David Rosenthal will continually remind those of you who are in the digital preservation community, money turns out to be a problem. We've had this already today. Money turns out to be, I'm sorry, uh, George, I would looked at you there inadvertently. You're sitting beside the door, I, I guess why. Uh, money turns out to be the problem. So here's three numbers, three numbers for you to line up. That's slightly dated now, but I think they're still right. Our ability to generate data is expanding at around 60% per year. Our ability to store data, that's to say the actual work that's going into manufacturing hard disks and tape materials, our ability to store information is increasing at about 40% per year. Sustainability crisis right there, because you can see how those statistics can't be sustainable for the long term. Now let's have a show of hands of people in the room who have had a 60% budget increase in the last year. <laughs> Yeah, Paul Backhouse, we knew it. Uh, no, of course it's not. And this is why we need to work smarter, work cleverer. And incidentally, as a throwaway line, remember that digital preservation is also, by default, about getting rid of stuff that we don't want to keep. Okay, because if we're not also getting rid of stuff, we're not going to be able to preserve really, to my mind, anything. Another conversation for later, perhaps. So those, to my mind, in very brief summary, are the challenges. How can we preserve uh, augmented reality and virtual reality? And, and I loved Stephen's uh, McConaughey. Where are you, Stephen? Stephen's slide uh, earlier with just the big white, the big white screen. I had exactly the same moment. What am I going to put on this to say? How are we going to fix this problem? And I know, you know, I'm waiting for the big reveal at the end when I show you all how to do it. And I'm going to tell you, it's not going to happen. So. Uh, what I reached, or you reached for the NDSA levels, actually probably a smarter move. What I reached for was this. I reached for this, the three-legged stool. What's it going to be like to solve the issue of preserving augmented reality, virtual reality, and related? It's going to involve those three sets of tools, technology, organization, and resources. And we're going to have to work on all three of those simultaneously for this to be a stable uh, uh, platform. So let me recommend thinking around digital preservation on all three parts of that uh, kind of structure. And if you're only thinking about technology, you're going to miss the policy piece. If you're only thinking about policy, you're going to miss the staffing piece. And if you think you have the technology and the staffing, then just wait till you try and get the budget, because all of those different pieces need to be put together uh, simultaneously. So that is everything you need to know about digital preservation in one, uh, <laughs> on one slide. 
I want to reflect on our experience finally on those sort of three legs. And again, really summary, very simple uh, kind of commentary, if you like, live uh, from the field. So let me start this by asking, uh, when does digital preservation become an issue? When does it become uh, an issue? And I want you to imagine a digital object a digital, you know, here's the kind of slide you can put together on a train coming to a conference. Uh, I want you to imagine a digital object life cycle, right? A digital object passing through various phases of its existence and certain things are happening. So this is scoped out as a digitization workflow, but you know, you imagine your own workflow in relation to this. You know, you start some project or other and that project, you capture some material and it goes through a variety of, you know, you add the metadata, you do some, quality assurance, you hand over perhaps to some service provider who's going to re you know, release it to the public, blah, blah, blah. And at the end, these times are not equal. You know, this is like more like a tube map. The connections are the point. At the end, you reach obsolescence. So when's the best time to intervene on that timeline? Anyone? That end. Yeah, yeah. Put, point that way if you think it's that way. Point that way if you think it's that way. Most of you are pointing that way. And you're right, because all the experience of the digital preservation community tells me it gets more expensive towards the end. And it's not to say we can't save it. It's just when you think of the numbers of materials that we're having to face and the cost sometimes of doing that recovery, well, you see where I'm going. We're not going to be able to afford it. And so for a decade or so, I've been telling people preservation at the outset preservation at the point of creation. That's when we need to think about preservation. And, you know, with a valiant efforts, if you like, from con conservation uh, 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 experts and, and, and archivists and preservation people over the decades, resolving these digital preservation challenges. But to be honest, it's already, in a sense, too late. We want to get it much earlier in the process, if we possibly can. So I've been saying preservation from the outset, and you know, <laughs> I've been wrong. I've been wrong. I've been wrong. And here's why. Because on one hand, you've got the digital object life cycle, but you've also got a sort of business process life cycle. And again, the business process life cycle introduces a variety of kind of key points. And again, scope this out for digitization, but it could be anything. You know, you have this idea, we're going to digitize. We'll get the 3D scanner sets out and we'll go and we'll, we'll scan, you know, the living daylights at Stonehenge or whatever it is you've got this week. And uh, you end up, you know, you work through it like this. Uh, you think about it, you invite people to join a conversation. It starts with a conversation. Then you have a, you know, a proposal, you have some funding, you have a variety of different processes involved. And I'm going to ask the same question. When's the right time to introduce digital preservation into this thinking? When's the right time? People are pointing up at me. I'm not sure what this means. <laughs> yes. So it's going to be, I've got that the wrong way. Oh, I've got that the right way around, haven't I? So, well, you want to introduce it at the start. That's my point I'm trying to make. Introduce it early in the business life cycle so it's not an afterthought. Because if it's an afterthought, it's going to be disruptive, especially if you've got large-scale digitization like we've heard of from the BFI. So think about it from the early days. And so I changed my tune, and I said, stop thinking about preservation at the outset of the digital object. Think of it at the start of the business process. And I think I'm coming to the view that I'm wrong there too. Because what you also have is an innovation life cycle. And actually, what we want are preservation-ready objects which are kind of coming out the systems already somewhat preservable. And that's where I think, are they still here, ladies still here from the, the creative catapult? That's where they should be investing, in an infrastructure that's ready for preservation. So maybe, <laughs> hopeful message, maybe for once we can get this right from the start. <coughs> maybe once we can get this right. I'm not holding my breath, but maybe once we can get this right from the start. So, uh, what we've learned, I'm almost done. One more observation about uh, technology. Digital preservation has been really good at data. Attention to data has been the thing. Migration has made the running. And it's made the running because we can manage information packages through various formats through time in a wonderful, relatively you know, complex but relatively understandable fashion. And of course, what we see in... Uh, 
scientific computing, uh, what we see in virtual reality is a set of interdependencies. An interdependency on, for example, software. It's no longer clear to me what the boundary between data and application is. And it's not clear to me in the context of preservation what the boundary between application, uh, data, indeed, and hardware is in this environment. We need to kind of tease that out. So do we understand the interdependencies between systems? And I think by and large we don't. I think by and large we need to be better at that. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, coming to that organisational part, and I'll just put this up on the screen without reading it out, we have to get used to the idea that our infrastructure is always going to need replaced. You know, it's always going to be subject to some new uh, uh, device, some new input, some new uh, use case that we haven't anticipated. And what I'm trying to get at there, you know, we're not going to announce to the world that Windows 95 was the zenith of computing and we should just fix everything there. We need to get used to the idea that these drivers for change are outside of our control and we need to live with those changes that are to some extent outside of our control. So we need to act in such a way that we can adapt to change. So some thoughts around this. Very, I'm going to bring it to a close. We're not trying to keep everything. Uh, we don't need to keep anything forever. Maybe we do, but it's not necessarily about keeping things forever or keeping everything forever. It's about keeping the things we need to keep for as long as we need to keep them. Uh, there's a big piece of the puzzle which is about sustainability. There's a big piece of the puzzle which is about very... Uh, unglamorous maintenance uh, of current and existing uh, systems. We need, I think, in the space of AR and VR, we need more models uh, of good practice. We've had such good inputs today, so uh, that gives me hope for the future. Uh, we need, we, we are, we need a lively community. We need to recognize this as emergent. We're going to have to have this meeting again, Judy. I don't know if that's good news or bad. We're going to need to do this meeting again every five years or more. Uh, also, if you're expecting this issue to go away, it's not going to go away. Uh, digital preservation is not going to take care of itself. So it requires some action, and sometimes that's going to require urgent action. In all of that work, just let me observe, finally, the DPC is a friend and partner to whatever preservation actions, whatever preservation research and development it is that you need to do. Some of you in the room are members of the DPC. Some of you... Uh, are not. And if you're interested in participating in that wide conversation, speak to us later. Thank you very much.